Now, as you've heard, I've been a writer for 15 years. There's a good reason that I'm a writer, uh, which is that I'm not particularly good at speaking. Uh, and so for this presentation, what I would like to do is try and use some images, uh, video images, photographic images that I've taken over the seven years that I've been in China to try to not only tell you about what's happening to China's environment, but to try to show you what's happened to China's environment. Um, and I'll begin with a, an introductory video. Oh, could we get the lights down maybe a little bit? Uh, make it a bit easier to see, that's great, thank you. Okay. This is a lake. This is a lake I was at earlier this year in Yunnan. Uh, after the worst drought in living memory, this is what happened to it. Uh, just uh, six months earlier, this was covered in water. The local people say they never remember uh, when seashells, the shellfish, dried up as they have done on this occasion. It was quite a shocking sight. That was in the south. Now, this is in the north. This is near Inner Mongolia, another lake completely dried up. And I show you these images because I think water is the biggest environmental problem that China faces. And it's one that doesn't just affect China because this, when the lakes dry up and you get this salty, dusty bed exposed to the elements, what happens is the wind picks it up and blows it and you get a problem with desertification and you have the dust storms that fly from places like this. We're now in Inner Mongolia uh, that fly from there, go across China, go across Beijing, across Korea, um, and, and some elements of it, according to some scientists, uh, end up here on the West Coast. So that's the, the very bad side of the environment. On the other side, there is absolutely remarkable things taking place trying to engineer a solution to China's problems. This is the uh, great water diversion project. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. High technology uh, to try to clean up industry. Um, and in addition, you're also seeing very uh, remarkable experiments in using algae to soak up carbon dioxide, um, all sorts of weird and wonderful science. And then, of course, uh, the, the now fairly well-known story of China's massive investment in renewable energy, in this case, of course, uh, solar energy, but not only solar energy. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but you're seeing a huge ramping up uh, of, of manufacturing capacity in these areas, uh, and also a lot more power generation, not just of solar, but also of wind power. Now, I, I show these images. That's, that's it at the end. It's just a little two-minute introduction, because I think it, if you were to summarize the conclusions of my book, um, they are very simple. The first one is, I think, that China's environmental crisis is uh, worse than most people in the outside world are aware of, but that the Chinese government and Chinese people are doing far more to deal with their environmental crisis than the outside world usually gives them credit for. I've I'm not a greenie. I should first add a little bit of an introduction. I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool greenie. You know, I, when I was in Japan, I was covering financial crises. I was covering football. Uh, I was covering new technology. Uh, then I came to China. I was a general news correspondent for five years or so, covering things like the tsunami, uh, covering the earthquake in Sichuan, the Beijing earthquake, all of those sorts of things. Um, Japanese gangster gangsters, the Japanese gangsters, land grabs. I was arrested, like most correspondents are, four or five times. All the usual stuff. Um, but around about 2007, 2008, I thought I need, I need a rest. I need a break. What I'll do is I'll write a book, and I'll move into the environmental area, because dealing with panda huggers and tree huggers has got to be much easier. <laughs> so I moved into that field. Um, but, of course, what I've found, um, particularly if you ever look at uh, the Comment is Free site on The Guardian, is that the environment and the climate in particular stirs up stronger passions than almost anything else. Uh, and in addition, in Copenhagen, I can't remember a time when there was ever more pressure on me as a reporter or on my newspaper. From the start of the conference when the European, Europeans were criticising The Guardian for leaking documents, 
to the end of the conference where the Chinese government was criticizing the government, uh, the Guardian, for running um, stories from Mark Linus and others about being in the room. I don't know if you remember that story. I was in the room. Um, I think this kind of intense emotion uh, signifies uh, just how important this subject has become. Uh, what, happen what is happening in China is of absolutely immense consequences, of course, for the whole world. Um, but what is fascinating, one thing I was able to do in writing a book is to try and put it in a little bit more of a historical and geographical perspective. And I tried to make it as accessible as possible. Uh, and the way I've tried to do that is to make it into a travelogue, a journey through China, a journey of about 60,000 miles, uh, six, yeah, 60,000 miles, uh, covering about 300 interviews uh, and seven years, a series of journeys, in fact. Uh, it's a journey that is intended to try to trace the journey I think mankind is taking in terms of economic development. And it's a journey that, it, in my case, I start here. I start, it's basically the book is divided into four parts. Sorry, I'm very dry. That's better. Um, it starts here in the southwest. This is Zhou Jai Go uh, in Sichuan. Um, I start here because I think it's very important to show just how rich China is ecologically. I think that often gets forgotten. We, we, we often think of China in terms of industry and smokestacks. Uh, there are more species in Sichuan than in all of North America. So it has a great deal to lose. Uh, so I look at the south, the southwest, and I look at the, the forests, I look at the mountains, the rivers, and the wildlife. Um, and I go from there, that's, that's one end of the journey, and the other end of the journey is here. Not very biodiverse at all. It, it, this is the, uh, the desert uh, in uh, Inner Mongolia, in Gansu. Uh, and I'm trying to show in this that I think we are getting further and further away from the first picture and closer and closer to this. Obviously, we're still in the middle, but I think this is the, the direction uh, that mankind is taking. Uh, not just China, and a lot of the conclusions I reach apply to China rather than just mankind. Um, as I said, on the way in the southwest, I look at the water systems and others. This is the Three Gorges before it was, uh, the, the reservoir was filled. Um, the second section in the southeast looks at how mankind is transforming our environment. It looks at globalization, urbanization, industrialization, and consumer culture. And the really spectacular cities that are being built, this is in fact Chongqing uh, by night, which really is spectacular. After that, I look at uh, the Northwest. And the Northwest is where I try and look at how we are moving out of balance. What are some of the environmental problems that are appearing? The pollution, uh, climate change issues, uh, and so forth. This is a huge open cast coal mine uh, between the border of Inner Mongolia and, and Shanxi province. Um, this approach that I've taken, uh, an eco travelogue, I don't think there is such a genre. Uh, and it has caused, caused some problems with Amazon because my book is classified uh, under the holidays and travel section. Uh, which, which worries me a great deal, because if anyone thinks it's a, a, a Chinese version of a year in Provence, they'll be in for a shock. Uh, it's, it's, if anything, it's a guide to all the places you probably don't want to go. Uh, it's cancer villages, um, waste dumps, big co open cast coal mines and so on. But it's not only that. As I said, you, the, there's the, the start, the biodiversity start, and I try to end Oh, oh uh, another bad thing. This is the world's worst traffic jam. I don't know if you remember this earlier this year. Uh, ten days of being clogged up. Uh, but and I end in the northeast uh, to try to show how China's trying to reinvent itself. Um, and I think if you just want to show in four slides the direction they want to take, it's from obviously very bad pollution, very, very smoggy city, uh, to um, a bit cleaner. You see the smoke is white here. It means more likely to have been scrubbed inside before it was emitted, trying to go high technology. And ultimately, you can't see very clearly, but these are wind turbines to try to move to a fully sustainable, um, recyclable, low-carbon 
or zero carbon economy. That's, that's the direction it wants to take. There have been, there's been amazing progress in this direction, um, and so much progress, in fact, that, um, yes, of course, you get days like this in Beijing um, from time to time, and, and you get um, people like, um, people asking, what color is China now? If we're going to give it one color, what's the color? Is it red China, communist China? Uh, or is it, as Tom Friedman says, is it green China? And that we should fear the fact, we, America in particular, should fear the fact that China's moving so fast in this energy of the future that the U.S. will be eclipsed. Um, well, I, I, I think there, uh, that there's good arguments for both. Uh, but the reality for me uh, of the seven years I've been in China is that I think red, fears of red China are outdated. Hopes for green China are as yet premature. Uh, if there's any color that I would give China these last seven years, you probably, any of you who've been there could probably guess, it's gray China. Uh, this is Beijing, just two weeks ago. Uh, uh, and this again is Beijing, or as local people call it, sometimes Greijing. And I've got this amazing collection of horrible pictures of cities in China in smog. This is in Henan, this is in Lanzhou, uh, and I should tell you at this point, it's not that horrible. <laughs> it's, it's smoggy and grey, but this was taken out of a hotel window that had those, you know, those tinted Tinted glass, so do not go to Lanjo thinking you will have to breathe yellow air. It's not that bad, but it's bad. Um, and Chongqing on a fairly normal day. And, and this, of course, is if you, if you see it from above, you might have seen these NASA pictures. Uh, effectively, what happens is if you have three or four days without wind, without rain, then the pollution from coal-fired power plants, uh, the emissions from the increasing number of vehicles on the road, they collect, they often get trapped on the western mountains, and then you get this sort of really murky gray cloud over a lot of the north of the country. Now, hopefully at, at this point some of you are thinking, well, so what? So what? Every country has been through this dirty phase of development. In Victorian Britain, Charles Dickens, around about 1850, thereabouts, wrote, uh, at the start of Bleak House, the, the smoke was curling out of the chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes, as if in mourning for the death of the sun. Now, it sounds worse than China today, um, but we can, many of us relate to this idea of the death of the sun from the pictures that you've just seen, and no doubt there have been times where parts of the US have been very similar, there are definitely times, I, I know Japan, when Japan was absolutely foul and horrible. Countries go through this phase. There is even um, an economic model, roughly speaking. It, it matches up with the Kuznets curve. The Kuznets curve is not usually used for the environment. There's a sort of environmental Kuznets curve. Um, and the idea is that this is a sort of tracks development. And at the start of development, countries are poor and clean. And then they go through this rapid growth phase where they burn a lot of cheap fuel, particularly coal. They cut down a lot of trees. They don't look, up, they don't look after their waste. But then they reach a point, depends on country to country, uh, where they want to clean up. And then they invest more in cleaning up and so forth. And then they carry on growing, but they clean up as they grow and they continue to get rich. And this is the model that's been followed time and time again. And we have to hope that this will be the model that China follows. But it's not necessarily going to follow exactly the same pattern. If you're optimistic, uh, as some people are, you hope that China will be able to take a shortcut across here. Uh, and because it can learn the mistakes that other countries have made, move up the value chain more quickly. Uh, but there's also reason to fear that it might not be the same for bad reasons. Uh, and they are, if we start to consider how do countries clean up uh, we tend to emphasize, there are two reasons. Um, we tend to emphasize the first one, genius, the things that reflect well on us as human beings, the fact that we use better technology, we invest more intelligently, we are more responsible about recycling and cleaning up. All those things help us clean up. But there is another side, perhaps not as big, but another side nonetheless, which is something that reflects badly on us as human beings, which is that we tend to dump our problem somewhere else, especially if we're richer and more powerful. Uh, and that is 
um, in a sense, what we euphemistically can call outsourcing in some way or regards. We outsource our environmental stress to countries coming up uh, a little bit behind us, and often they're very happy to accept that as the, as the price of getting wealthy. Um, and we see that in China. Um, this is in, in Guayu, the recycling, uh, one of the big recycling centers there. It's, it's effectively the place where the world's computers go to die. It's a graveyard for uh, electronic goods and very poorly regulated. Um, you see people like this guy. His job is actually not too risky because he's recycling plastic uh, and plastic is not that dangerous. But in the same area, you have people recycling lots of um, uh, televisions and screens where they're exposed to cadmium and mercury, um, lead, brominated flame retardants, all those sorts of nasty things. Um, so obviously that's one way in which uh, the problems of richer countries are outsourced. Another way is that we tend to outsource um, a lot of energy intensive polluting industry. Um, quite how much, yes it's debatable, but there have been studies that suggest something like 16 to 24 percent of China's carbon emissions are actually emitted uh, during the manufacture of goods that are actually consumed in Western nations. So clearly we're outsourcing at some point. So yeah, China maybe will start to do the same things. Maybe it will start to put environmental stress on other countries that are coming up behind it by sourcing more materials from there, by giving some industries that it doesn't want to other nations. And there are some signs of this, certainly in terms of sourcing materials. You're seeing more Chinese involvement um, in, in Africa in uh, Latin America, um, and even s perhaps some industry uh, starting to, Chinese investment in industry in Africa as well now. Um, but it's a bit trickier, and I think it's a bit trickier for China to outsource of all its environmental stress for two reasons. One is it, it's so big. If we kind of see an accumulation of environmental stress at each time as the world economy, the developed world economy gets bigger and bigger, China's kind of absorbed a lot of that at the moment. Um, and when you get to a China scale, where is the next country you can give it to? Or the next area? Not easy. Not impossible, but not easy. Uh, and then the other thing, the other uh, reason it might be difficult for China is the timing. The timing of China's rise makes it rather tricky. Um, I've tried to show on this graph um, just roughly how much of the, the world mankind is eating uh, and that uh, the, the, the idea is this is how much we consume. So if you consider uh, the grey and the black as like two jaws getting ever wider, uh, the top one is the human population and how quickly it's grown. And you see during the pre-industrial era, for hundreds of, maybe even thousands of years, it didn't change enormously. There would have been a bit more fluctuation than this, of course. Um, but it would have gone around about here. Then it hit the Industrial Revolution. We see this huge surge. So... There's, there's twice as many people in China today as there were in the whole world in, say, 1750. Then the black side, how much energy each of us uses on average. And again, it would have gone up a bit, up and down a bit here, but not an enormous difference. You get to the Industrial Revolution, and wham, uh, according to some environmental historians, um, the average person on Earth today uses the equivalent of say, 20 slaves' worth of electricity or of energy. I don't know how you measure a slave's worth of, of energy, but I, I think it gives you a rough idea of how much more we can use. So that's all very well when you start off and you're, you know, you're the start of the Industrial Revolution. My country, Britain, 200-odd uh, years ago, starts off. Um, it's got the whole world to pollute, pretty much. And small country, relatively modest demands of the Manchester textile mills and so on, uh, so it can take resources from a lot of the world, can emit a great deal without making an enormous difference to the whole planet. But then, of course, when you get to the situation we're in now, um, you have uh, a lot less of the world to take resources from and to pollute, and now you more of the world that is doing the consuming and the polluting. So China, um, it's going to be harder for them to outsource their problem. So what I think... A tentative conclusion, I would say, that uh, I, I've reached just from traveling around so much, is that um, it's di more difficult for China to outsource its problems. So perhaps what we're seeing is China insourcing its problems, pushing from the developed coastline, which is where all the industry has clustered so far, 
and pushing some of the dirtier industry inland, not the manufacturing, because that still has to be by the coast, but some of the other stuff. Uh, but in particular, trying to take more uh, resources from remote areas. And three places that formerly considered very remote that you're seeing a great deal of development in now. One uh, in Inner Mongolia, here on the bend of the Yellow River. Uh, this is quite dramatic uh, industrialization and heavy industry here as Inner Mongolia has now become the big coal center of China, overtaking Shanxi just last year. Then down in Tibet, of course, um, considered, if anything, even more remote and inaccessible for a long time than the Gobi Desert. Uh, now you have the railway. You soon have the spurs from the railway. They'll be taking more of the rich mineral resources from Tibet. And uh, I'm pretty sure in the next 5, 10, 15 years, you'll see a lot of dam building on the Yalong Sampo, uh, which is the Brahmaputra further downstream. Um, and indeed, it has already started there. And then finally, Xinjiang, another in a sense, very remote area. This is the part of the world that is furthest from the sea. Um, this has, Xinjiang contains, of course, we all know the oil, the gas, but it also has 40% of China's coal deposits. Uh, and until, uh, until now, they haven't tried to tap them because it costs so much money to transport them by rail or by truck to where they're needed. Uh, but now you have new technology, um, gasifying coal, liquefying coal, so you should be able to pipe it uh, across the country. And uh, a couple of senior policy makers and scientists said that is what China plans to do in the years ahead. So it's, it's quite striking when you visit these places. It really reminds you that place, there, there's almost nowhere that is remote on Earth anymore. Uh, and nature is really not very natural anymore. So you're really pushing at these geographical and ecological limits. Um, and that made me uh, think, well, what other possible ecological limits might we be approaching? What other ways might we be hitting um, stress because of where the economy is impacting on the environment? Uh, and indeed, could we be reaching a wall? You know, is it just a bottleneck or is it a wall? Um, and is it possible that um, my country, the UK, and China are, are like bookends on this phase of development, this incredible phase of development and growth that mankind has never seen before, and will we be able to continue it or not? Um, so looking at some of the other uh, areas of impact, of stress, of ecological bumps, uh, as I said, water is a huge one. The quality of the water is enormous, half the water in China the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection said this year is not fit to drink. Uh, something like a quarter is not supposed to be fit for any other use even. Um, that's a big problem. Get some, this is a, a, a eutrophied lake with algae on the top lake, lake, down in Kunming. Um, this is a, a paddy field that's gone yellow because it's very close to a, a chemical plant. Uh, and this is a, a paper mill runoff. Uh, where the water's gone a very dramatic shade of red. And when you start to get to the point where you're putting so many toxins in your water supply that the water cannot flush them through um, uh, w w quickly enough, then those toxins start to build up in other areas. Uh, and the most dramatic area is human health. Um, this lady, uh, Zhang, Zhang Guming, uh, she lives in uh, Yunnan province, uh, Xinlong town. Uh, and as you can see, her hair is falling out. She's receiving treatment for chemotherapy. Uh, and she blames her cancer uh, on an industrial plant that opened up on the edge of her village 10 to 15 years ago. Um, I couldn't prove it, but I could say that in that village, almost everybody believed the same thing. The doctor said the same thing. The local environmental bureau admitted that carcinogens were being released into the water and they couldn't do anything about it. So it's a strong case, not conclusive, but a strong case. Uh, and there are thought to be somewhere between 100 to 400 of these so-called cancer villages. The World Bank says something like 400,000 people die every year prematurely because of pollution. Now, when you start to have such health fears, health limits, 
you have an impact on what society can tolerate. You have a, a, a question of order uh, and you do get protests. We don't know exactly how many protests are related to the environment uh, and environmental concerns because uh, the government uh, has stopped releasing the figures on, on mass incidents. Uh, but this is one I went to um, several years ago in Jurjan where a, a village fought off a thousand riot police uh, because they did not want a chemical plant built on the edge of their plant, or on the edge of their uh, community. So you do get uh, cases like this. Um, another area where you might start to hit the limits is um, where you start to run out of certain kinds of resources in certain places. Uh, there are a number of towns and uh, regions have been declared resource depleted areas because they've run out of coal or they've run out of uh, whatever mineral that they uh, specialize in. The, this is uh, up in uh, Ichun in Heilongjiang. Um, it's, it's close to the border with Siberia. Um, it was minus 35 degrees when I was there. Very, very cold. Coldest I've ever been. These guys were used to it though. They're loggers. This, is, this has been China's main logging region for uh, at least 50 years. Um, but when I spoke to this guy here, uh, he said, we, in two years we've been told we've got to stop. We've got to stop logging. And I thought, well, that's, that's tough for you, for your job, but it's probably good for the environment. Um, but why? Why does that happen? He said, well, we, we haven't got any trees left that we can log that are mature enough in this area. The government wants to let it grow up again. Uh, and in a sense, it's, that's terrific news. Um, one of the really good pieces of environmental news out of China is China is, uh, according to one zoologist I spoke to, uh, planting more trees than the rest of the world put together. So fantastic news, particularly for carbon sequestration. Um, there is a problem about the quality of those trees. They all tend to be two or three species uh, rather than actually biodiverse forest. And the other problem is that if you suppress supply but demand continues to grow, which is exactly what's happened, you have to get the wood from somewhere. So the stress gets exported across the borders. Uh, and this is a very common site. This, is, this photograph was actually taken in Mongolia, in Ulaanbaatar, where the main rail line uh, is just trees and logs and timber uh, almost endlessly, um, certainly um, uh, uh, in the main depot. Uh, and <coughs> this is because the, the main trade in timber now is between Russia and China. Uh, and China's regrowing its forests but Russia's tiger Siberian forests are actually being cut down. So uh, the net result is we are losing the world's forests, even though China is doing a good job. And it's not just China's fault again, because uh, a, a fairly substantial share, less than half, but a substantial share of these wood products are then used in materials that are then exported to the US, to Europe, and other places. Um, another resource that we're losing is biodiversity, um, harder, much harder to measure. Um, this is partly because of over, over uh, excessive demand. Uh, it's also because of very irresponsible practices. Uh, this, <laughs> I took this picture out, outside of Beijing. This guy's fishing with electricity. That's a, that's a power pack on his back. And everything that goes between the two poles dies. Um, not great at this scale, but when you get ships and boats doing it, you have a serious problem because you just indiscriminately wipe out everything in between. And then there some people use explosives. Um, and the government's trying to crack down on this, it's for sure. Uh, but in some cases, it's too late. Um, this is the Baiji dolphin. You probably know all about this. This is, uh, I went on the last mission to try to find this poor dolphin. It's been around for 20 million years on Earth. Um, not anymore. Uh, it was a very, very sad um, uh, expedition. Uh, we had all of the world's leading uh, marine biologists, uh, sonar experts, great equipment, backing by Budweiser and the Communist Party, didn't find one. So too late. Sometimes it can be too late and it was too late for this poor creature. Um, but of course the main limit that we are concerned at at the moment is have we reached the limit that the climate can tolerate for our growth? in terms in particular of greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide. In China I've found 
compared to the UK certainly, there is a lot less of a debate between believers and climate skeptics. Uh, and that might be uh, because uh, the, the media is more controlled, uh, but I think it's also because of places like this. Um, this is uh, one of China's 36,000 glaciers. China has more glaciers than anywhere else in the world, um, often described as the third pole for that reason. This, this glacier, though, is very interesting. Um, in particular, interesting, it's, it's the Urumqi Number no. 1 Glacier. Um, and it's interesting because it's the first glacier that was ever measured in China. Uh, and I spoke to the scientist who was on that first mission. Uh, he's very old now. He's retired, of course. It was back in 1959 at the height of the Great Leap Forward. And in a sense, irony of irony now that we're so worried about the glaciers melting, his mission was to go here and try to accelerate the melting, make the ice melt more quickly, because they wanted to use the meltwater for irrigation. Um, so they sent people up into the mountains to try and different techniques. There are propaganda pictures of uh, soldiers throwing bombs uh, at the glacier. That didn't work very well. But they did find a technique, uh, borrowed I think from Soviet Union, that worked extremely well, which is that you take uh, hundreds of laborers with bags of coal dust and they go up and they sprinkle the dust on the mountain. The white surface becomes a black surface, it attracts more heat and it melts. Uh, so very efficient but fortunately uh, after a couple of years they decided perhaps it's not such a good idea to melt glaciers um, along with a lot of other things uh, of the Great Leap Forward that they decided were not such a good idea. So they stopped trying to melt it but they carried on measuring it. And so they have a very good record of how this glacier has retreated. Um, and I think this sort of feeds into uh, a body of other evidence that China is being very badly affected by climate change. Again, water is the thing that uh, probably worries people the most. This is uh, the picture you saw earlier. Um, and this lady kind of shows how it's a human problem. The people who are affected uh, by these sorts of things tend to be the people, the poorer people living on the environmental edge. Uh, this lady's name is Namuhua. She's a Mongolian. About 15, uh, she lives near Herbei and in a Mongolia on the border. And about 15 years ago, she and the other people in her area got together and decided they wanted to have a share of the China's economic boom. So they put their money together. They invested in a resort on the edge of Anguli Lake. Uh, they had pony trekking around the lake. They had uh, um, fishing and uh, pleasure boats. Uh, unfortunately, after a couple of years, that's what happened to their lake. Um, this wall here was the ticket office for the boats. And here, this is the pier that used to run, and the pleasure boats were along the pier. And there was a buried boat you might have seen in the video before. Um, so I think this you know, shows, one, the human impact, two, the economic impact. These people's livelihoods were ruined. And three, how it can have a, a, a knock-on effect uh, for society and urbanization, because most of the people from this village have had to move into the city because they couldn't make a livelihood elsewhere. Well, so that's, that's the grim news. That's the bad news. Um, I'll, just some of the things that I think China's trying to do to get over this. The good thing is the government has not stuck its head in the sand. Uh, they are very well aware of their problems. They have a president who is a hydro engineer, you have a prime minister who is a geologist, and uh, I call them in my book, you know, President Water and Premier Earth. You know, they, they know the problems uh, very well, but they do, for the same reason, tend to have uh, an approach to solving them that emphasizes science and engineering. Um, and that's why one of the things that they've done extremely well is allocate a great deal of resources and policy instruments to developing renewable energy. This is uh, a wind farm. If you travel along the old Silk Road now, it's lined by wind farms. It's really dramatic. The north of China, in particular, Gansu, Inner Mongolia, spectacular. The wind capacity, uh, wind, genera wind power generating capacity of China has pretty much doubled every year for the past five or six years, overtaken the US and Germany to become number one. Um, really big push forward. Um, same, not quite the same for solar. Solar has, it's, is surging, but from a much lower base. Um, usually for uh, solar water heaters, but China's also the biggest manufacturer of solar panels, of course. 
um, and you're starting to see some utility scale experiments in places like this. This is in Gansu province um, where I was at uh, last year. Um, to try to get, because that, a lot of that energy is in very remote places, and in this sense China is almost blessed by its deserts because you've got lots of areas to put wind farms and solar panels, but to get that energy to where it's needed you need uh, a new uh, electricity grid which China's investing in robustly. Um, altogether it said China's investing I think last year 34 billion dollars in uh, clean technology. Uh, the US last year I think was 18 billion dollars in clean technology so almost double. Uh, also trying to solve problems with massive engineering projects. Um, this is the South North water diversion uh, project this is one of the most interesting parts. I was there last year. This is the section that actually goes under the Yellow River. So if you imagine, the, most of the water comes from the Yangtze in the south. It's supposed to go up to Beijing and Tianjin, in particular in the north. But you've got the Yellow River in the way. <coughs> if you just run it into the Yellow River, it will just go straight out to sea. So you have to plumb it right under the Yellow River and back up again. Uh, so this is the, you know, one of the biggest plumbing operations on Earth. Uh, and uh, this guy very kindly showed me around. Then you've got some really wild science to try and solve the problems. Um, this is a company called ENN. Um, <coughs> they're using uh, algae to absorb carbon dioxide. Um, it's, the algae can double in size in a day, and then the idea is, they haven't perfected it yet, but the idea is that you'll be able to use this for biofuel or for animal feed. And I heard a rumor that I have not been able to confirm. It will be a great story if I can, which is they think growing, doubling in size every day is not good enough. So we need to splice the, uh, the algae gene with a cancer gene. <laughs> really far out stuff. Um, and then the other reason to be fairly optimistic is there's a lot of stuff going at the grassroots of people trying to change their own environments. Uh, this Tibetan guy, uh, a photographer down in uh, Shangri-La, he's, he's campaigned to try to stop illegal logging down there. As you can see in this area, not awfully successfully uh, in that area, but in other places he has done so. Um, but then you start to get to that issue of, of governance and uh, is, is, a, is the power structure making it more difficult to clean up the environment on a local level? Uh, and I think it's the, the record there is a, a best mix probably, uh, on the whole, a, a bad thing um, because you do not have an independent uh, judiciary, you do not have a, a free media, and these things in other countries have been very important in pushing for uh, environmental cleanup. Um, a lot of the coal mine accidents uh, have been covered up, um, and some of the industrial accidents to this guy. Uh, there's a local paper mill basically flooded all his farmland uh, with, with um, polluted wastewater, ruined his life. Uh, he hasn't been able to get adequate compensation um, and he says it's difficult for him to get the word out. This is Wu Li Hong's wife. Wu Li Hong um, is an activist in Jiangsu province who was put in prison for several years because he blew the whistle on some polluting uh, plants in his area. He's been recently been released uh, but says he's, he's again um, not being um, given the chance to um, uh, completely uh, articulate his concerns about the continuing pollution there. Uh, Hu Jia, um, in prison now, um, he started out uh, his activism as a, as a university student um, working um, in, in Yunnan um, with, with some environmental groups and, and has moved into other areas subsequently. I think he got in trouble, it was not because of the environment, of course, it was, it was much more to do with his democracy um, advocacy. Uh, and, I, and I put in uh, Liu Xiaobo, uh, who's the recent Nobel Prize winner. Um, and I, I put him there because I, I, I think, in some sense, this debate about whether democracy can solve China's environmental problems um, can, can slightly go too far. Uh, I think um, some democracy could certainly help some problems. I think it would certainly help with uh, the pollution problems, um, I think it would help expose some of the corruption that leads to those pollution problems. It might involve, it might help to protect certain habitats, particularly in minority areas. Um, but I think that one of the things um, I came to 
realize much more strongly in writing this book, and it took about four years, is that pretty much when I started out, I would have said the biggest problems China faces environmentally are pollution, climate change, and probably the, the communist one-party power structure and the difficulties that that leads because of lack of transparency and accountability. But uh, I concluded uh, by saying all those things, yes, they're very important, uh, but I was more concerned about uh, a loss of biodiversity, about the global problems behind China's environmental problems, uh, and in particular, uh, consumption. I think in the long term, I'm rather more concerned about consumption than pollution. Why? Because I think you can clean up pollution. As we've seen time and time again, enough money and political will, you can deal with pollution. Consumption, however, is so much more difficult because very few people consider it a problem. And if you look at it from an environmental point of view, yes, it's a problem. If you look at it from an economic point of view, it's exactly what we need, more Chinese consumption. You hear it again and again. And, and that is correct. Uh, but at what point will we start to consume too much? Uh, and I think that, that is the, 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 the big question uh, that, that I took away from looking at what happened in China. Something very interesting happened in 2008, uh, which is that up until then, in two up until 2007, uh, every year the world WWF, the, envir the environment group WWF, produced um, the sort of footprint of people in each country, the environmental footprint. Uh, and up until 2007, they assessed that people in China lived just about within the world's means. So in other words, if everyone on Earth lived like the average Mr. and Mrs. Wang in 2007, we would live as a species within the world's ecological limits. However, of course, nobody aspires downwards. Uh, and in fact, Mr. and Mrs. Wang, like most people, you want to keep up with the Joneses. And if we keep up with the Joneses, uh, depending which Joneses, if it's the Joneses of Europe, we'll need three Earths. If it's the Joneses of the US, we will need four and a half planets. Uh, we don't have them. Um, in 2008, for the first time, China moved over into the negative, into the deficit side. Um, and yes, they're still very, very far behind on a per capita basis in terms of consumption, um, carbon emissions and so forth. But their trend is very clearly towards catching up in some pockets already starting to overtake. Um, Shanghai as the beachhead, um, I think I calculated if, if, if everyone in China has a Shanghai lifestyle, the current Shanghai lifestyle, uh, it would mean an additional 260 million air conditioners, 166 million microwaves, 159 million refrigerators, and an extra 187 million cars on top of what we already have. Um, and what you're seeing, uh, it's going to be one of your lectures in the future it sounds like, um, but some areas like Shanghai here, this is carbon emissions per person. Shanghai is already, on average, overtaken the UK and France. It's also overtaken some cities uh, like Tokyo. Um, now there's, you know, they have a steel plant, they have um, heavy industry, so it, it's not it, it, exactly fair comparison, but the trend is definitely in that direction. So um, I would say that, uh, just to wrap up, uh, in the future we will see uh, more environmental stress. I don't think uh, pollution, I think China is starting to get a grip on and in the future you'll see them getting more of a grip on that and then the next five year plan in particular you'll see them getting more of a grip on that. But you will see um, environmental stress being felt not so much on pollution and what we, what we emit but in terms of what we take in and overusing resources. The rare earths uh, tension we had recently um, being perhaps a, 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 a small indicator, but more important will be energy stress, um, water stress, food stress, what they do to global markets and so on. And those will determine if, if, if China can solve these problems, if China can't solve these problems and other countries can't solve these problems, we will see environmental stress producing other kinds of stress. It will be a security issue. It's already a security issue, but it will be a growing security issue. However, if China can move towards a more sustainable um, form of development, um, then it will set a, a much needed example. Uh, I'm not saying with the idea of a billion Chinese jumping that China shouldn't jump to a better lifestyle. Clearly a billion people in the rich world have already jumped to this unsustainable lifestyle. 
And there are several billion coming up behind, moving in the direction. China, I think, is in the tipping point in between. It's the point where you really have to find new solutions. So just to wrap up with something I jotted in my notebook, um, traveling across the Tibetan plateau a few years ago. Um, in the 19th century, I think my country, Britain, taught the world how to produce. I think in the 20th century, the United States taught the world how to consume. And I think in the 21st century, uh, we really need someone, perhaps China, to teach the world how to sustain. Uh, extraordinarily difficult challenge, uh, but if they could do that, maybe that's their way that they appeal to the world, the soft power appeal that they've been missing all of this time.